and like um, and like probably everybody here um I'm a little obsessed with with birding and and um also with bird photography. Here's a list of ways you can get in touch with me. Um if you go to birdsnaps.ca you can find all these ways as well and you can also see my photos if that's something that um that interests you. All right. So One of the things I think we've all been seeing is that birding has become immensely popular, especially since the pandemic. Here are four headlines that I've just copied and pasted um, into the presentation. First one is CBC's, how birding's pandemic popularity is expanding data collection for science. Um, eBird will confirm that. Um, Cornell saying a third of American adults are bird watchers, according to a nationwide survey. I won't make any comments about who they voted for. <laughs> um, the black one is uh, National Geographic saying, could a birding boom in the US help conservation take flight? I think this is something we all hope. Um, and then the New York Times ran a really great article called, the birds are not on lockdown, more people are watching and more people are watching them. Again, these are all related to moments around the pandemic. We know this. There's a growth in the popularity of birding and bird photography. And we probably all have anecdotes about seeing more people um, doing this. So this is all probably good news. Um, I like to think that it's good news. Um, it's in, what we're seeing, I think, is an increased awareness of the beauty and diversity of birds, habitats, flightways, lifeways. And also, I hope, of the precarious state of birds and their habitats. Um, and one can always hope that this translates into greater support for conservation efforts. Um, but it also brings people into places where they may have greater negative impact on birding and, uh, sorry, on birds and their habitats without knowing that that's what's going on. And I think that one of the things that organizations like the OFO, but even, you know, Audubon in the United States, um, any of the journals that are around birding need to be doing is probably a better job of explaining how we might actually be impacting negatively the very birds we love to see and photograph. Um, so more knowledge about bird behavior and habitat actually, I think, makes for better bird photography. Um, so let me just see where I am on this slide. Um, I've actually talked to a number of you all call them new bird photographers, new since, you know, they started sometime during the pandemic. And some of them have said to me that they just wish that they knew a little bit more about how not to negatively impact birds. And so a talk like this um, is the kind of thing that I think can do that. Although I think I'm probably preaching to the choir here with the members of OFO, um, but I'll still talk about it. Um, I also think that there are some photographers who just don't care. I don't know what to do about them. Um, so I'm just going to continue talking about those who might care. Um, if you Google bird photography or wildlife photography ethics guidelines, you will get pages upon pages of hits that are that more or less cover the same kind of ground. Things like minimize your disturbance to birds, minimize disturbance to habitat, limit or completely avoid using taped recordings to lure birds, don't use live or dead animals to bait raptors, respect other birders and bird photographers, respect private property and public spaces, and be thoughtful about how you share and caption your photos on social media. So I'm gonna cover some of these pretty quickly and then move to a discussion about social media um, after that. And let's start with some guidelines. I think that any ethics of any kind of wildlife photography needs to start here. Birding is never a solo act, even when done alone. Birding always includes others, even if they are non-human. When we bird, we should do so consciously and conscientiously being attentive to attentive to all forms of life that surround us, human and non-human. This is core to the ethics of all birding practices. 
And I like to think that all of us actually believe that. Um, and I certainly do. Um, whether I'm birding with just my binoculars or if I've got my great big camera with me, these are things that I try to follow every day when I'm out birding. So first, minimize disturbance to birds. And for photographers, this is actually really important because the best photographs come from the least disturbance to your subject. You disturb birds, they fly away. You're not going you may not get another opportunity. So how do you approach birds and get good photographs of birds without disturbing them? Well, one thing we know is that birds are really sensitive to your proximity, to your noise and to your movement. So avoid trying to get too close. You know, if you think that you're not going to get a nice close up of the bird, be satisfied with a wide angle, more sort of environmental or habitat kind of photograph. And be patient. Many of us know that birds will come to you if you are quiet and stand still and wait. If you know that the birds are around, they might come to you. Sometimes they don't, sometimes they do. And here's one that probably all of us have been guilty of at least once in our lives is when a bird shows itself, avoid shrieking, there it is, and running to get a closer position. I've done this before, always scares away the birds. So avoid that kind of excited response to the bird showing up. Um, one of the things that you also don't want to do are cause uh, um, is to cause birds to fly. Um, sometimes when you cause birds to fly, you don't only lose your chance at a nice photo, but you might actually cause stress and expose birds to predators. Um, that's something to keep in mind, um, certainly with some kinds of birds, when they suddenly come out into the open and predators might come after them. In a place where I bird a lot, um, in fall, there was always a juvenile Cooper's hawk around. Um, and it's very aware that there are also several species of warblers around and so on. And, you know, what it's one, and I've noticed before that it seems to follow me as I'm moving around. Um, so it's something to consider that making them fly and come out of cover exposes them to predators. Purposely flushing birds simply to get a photograph is just inexcusable, in my opinion. I joke about it with my friends, but I would never do it. Um, so also we want to, um, minimize disturbance to birds by standing back. Close-ups aren't the only or even the best option. For those of us who are on social media, looking at bird photographs, we often see close-ups of birds and that has sort of become the expectation or the norm, um, in what, get, in the, in the really well-liked photographs that are on um, social media. I would suggest to consider taking environmental photos. This is something I do a lot of um, rather than close-ups. And just to remember that birds are more than just their bodies on a perch. They're also the environment in which they exist. And that can be beautiful just as much as a close-up can be. So just look at this photo for a second. I'll try to, if I can click the right button. We're getting there. There we go. So here we have a wood thrush. It's not really a close up. It is somewhat of a close up, but this wood thrush was really quite far away from me. And this is the closest I could crop the image and maintain a certain amount of quality. But the version of this photo I like more, I don't know why my clicking isn't working all of a sudden, is this one, which is pulled back further, showing much more context and it also shows a certain amount of um, of size of the bird in relation to the tree that it's in. I really quite like the um, pulled back one. I've got others that are like that. Let's go. So this is a uh, fall fall plumaged palm warbler. Um, it's in a field of grass. This is at Coots Paradise here in Hamilton at Princess Point. And for me, this more environmental shot is, in fact, much more interesting. Um, it shows the bird in its environment, shows that the bird lives with environments, um, and it lives within these kinds of environments, and actually says something a little more about the bird than the close-up does, in my opinion. 
um, the shot that you saw in the very first um, screen that I showed is of this Cape May warbler. So this was taken at uh, Copacabana Woods, just outside of Point Pelee, a couple of uh, springs ago. Um, you know, they're gorgeous birds. How can you not love the look of a Cape May warbler? And the color of it within that green is really beautiful. But I also find this shot that's pulled back further, in my opinion, I mean, maybe because it's my own photograph, I love it even more because it's showing much more of the environment that the bird lives in. Okay. So, in addition to trying not to disturb birds, I think we should minimize, we should always be trying to minimize our disturbance to habitat. The habitat we impact might be the habitat that our subjects actually need. Um, so be very attentive when you're out birding to the wildlife and the flora that's around you. You know, what are you stepping on as you're walking through the woods? Um, if there's a path, avoid straying off of it. Um, and this is especially true in parks and conservation areas um, where they clearly don't want you to. You know, you go to Point Pelee and they say, do not walk off the paths. That just makes total sense to me. And that's fine. And that's okay. Um, and people should also try to avoid moving or removing deadfall or cutting branches to get a closer or clearer view um, of a bird. Again, that habitat might be important to the bird you're trying to photograph or to other wildlife that's in the area. Um, a story a, a birder told me once that he was taking photographs of a hooded um, merganser and the hooded mergansers would go in behind the sort of clump of deadfall that was laying in the water. And then he went there the next day and someone had removed all that um, deadfall and the birds weren't there anymore. They weren't there anymore because they were using that as shelter, as protection from being exposed to potential predators and to humans probably. Um, so when I go into the woods, when I go into parks, I think about myself going into someone else's home. If I went into, let's say Paul, who's watching this now, his home, I wouldn't go up the stairs of his house and into the bedrooms and start looking around. I would be respectful of his space. I would go to where he goes. I would probably end up in his dining room or his kitchen, and we'd go from there. Um, all right. Some areas are really particularly sensitive. Um, so staying back from nests and nesting colonies and feeding areas, I think is really important. This is a time that if you can get the, um, the environmental shot, the context shot, it's actually probably interesting, more interesting than showing a close up. Um, and this goes without saying that stay out of fenced areas that are fenced for habitat protection. Um, that just makes sense. Um, anyway, once again, consider the wide angle shot. So this one is a little more um, controversial or up for discussion, and that's avoiding taped playback to lure birds. Taped playback works for passerines, especially, and, you know, warblers in spring or fall, but at what cost to the birds and to others? Um, and so birds are really sensitive to the time of year, and we should be attentive to the time of year. Playing tape song during breeding periods, like spring or even in summer when um, the chicks have hatched and they're in the nest, this can cause serious um, interruptions to breeding. So many birds use song in their courtship rituals to attract a mate. So let's say you start playing a Blackburnian warbler song in May when there's Blackburnian warblers around. Well, it could be that a female Blackburnian warbler is lurking in the woods somewhere else, you know, paying attention to the male warbler. This male warbler might come out to see this tape of a, a Blackburnian warbler and think that it needs to, um, to make that Blackburnian warbler go away. But if it doesn't successfully fend off that warbler, the female might think, well, that guy is just not worth my time. I'm going to go find somewhere else. So it can actually have an impact on successful breeding. And when nesting, if you're playing um, uh, tapes, that might take the birds away from the nest, which it automatically exposes the eggs or the chicks to predators. And you know, squirrels know that that nest is probably there and they're going to try to get at it if it becomes open and available. 
In fall, um, playback might be a little less of an issue. One of the issues though, is that repeated playback increases stress on tired and hungry birds, but also on other people who are there birding. Um, so just be attentive to your surroundings um, and don't, you know, bug people by constantly playing playback to attract birds. They, they'll stop listening at some point anyway. So, all right. Um, one more, don't use live or dead bait. To me, this is a no-brainer, but some people still do it to attract raptors, to, um, and which can create many problems. Now, I can see science using this to attract raptors so that they can be captured and banded or studies can be done. There's always a time when all of these um, ethical guidelines can be broken. But for the sake of a photograph, I wouldn't say there's ever a time that using live or dead bait is uh, viable. One of the things that can happen is that if you introduce non-native mice into the ecosystem and the predator's diets, what pathogens are in those mice that might actually impact the health of the raptors that you're trying to get photographs of? Um, Scott we Widensall wrote an article in 2016 that was published in Audubon, and the link is there in my slide. And he makes two basic points. One is the owls don't need the food. You know, it's not like when you have a feeder set up in your backyard, you get a foot of snow and suddenly all the birds come because all of their food sources are covered by snow. That's not what the issue is. Um, the biggest reason not to feed wild hours, he says, is how quickly they, they can become habituated to humans. And this is especially dangerous along roadsides where they can end up being hit by cars. Unfortunately, baiting owls is a practice that is continuing to be used by some photographers to get the cool dive shot or feeding shot. I have a little bit more to say about owls in a minute. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about respect to other birders and bird photographers. Be attentive to others who are there. Um, other birders and photographers are there for the same reason you are. You don't want to be the person who flushes the bird. I've done this by mistake before, and it's really embarrassing. Um, so share the time and space res respectfully by being attentive to, other, um, to others and mindful of your own actions. So I have an anecdote about this that I'd like to share, which I shared with people on Facebook back in May. So I was at Wheatley Beach, uh, Wheatley Harbor, in the beach in Wheatley Harbor in May. And as many of you probably know, in May, shorebirds gather there. Um, you often get a lot of um, ready turnstones, but you also get other interesting shorebirds. And what I saw there in the afternoon was um, some sanderlings in breeding plumage. And I'd actually never seen them in breeding plumage before. I always see them in their winter plumage, that white and black plumage. Um, and so I was really excited by this. The problem was in the afternoon on the beach, you get all kinds of heat shimmer and photographs are useless. You can take a hundred, they're all useless. So I went back later in the evening after dinner and I'm anyone who knows much about shorebirds knows that if you just sit there and don't move and just remain quiet and wait for the shorebirds, they will come close. They don't mind you. So that's what I was doing. And while I was doing that, um, the shorebirds were still way down the beach and I was waiting for them. They were coming my way and I was getting excited. I could actually see the sanderlings making their way towards me. These two um, birder photographers showed up and one of them walked right to where the birds were. And as she was laying down to take the, you know, close angle, the uh, direct angle shot, they all flew. Um, and this is what I got was a shot of uh, ready turnstones flying. Actually, there's more than ready turnstones. I see there's a Dunlin in there as well. There's probably more. And it was really disappointing because I'd been sitting there patiently waiting. Um, and this felt like a time when they weren't being attentive to the situation that they were in. Um, so be respectful of others. I mean, this all of these guidelines go for birding and bird photography. So owls are a bit of a special case um, and owl season has begun and social media is exploding with owl photos. I'm sure those of you who are on Facebook and Instagram are seeing owl photos a lot, especially on Facebook right now. 
Um, I find it a bit distressing, the number of owl photos that I'm seeing and the kinds of owl photos that I'm seeing. And what inevitably happens is that some owls become celebrity birds with photographer photographers spending hours or even full days with them. Um, and, you know, if someone were spending hours with me or full days with me, someone who I didn't know or groups of people, I'd get a little, you know, stressed by this. So do owls, especially when most owls actually try to sleep through the day. Um, so some do's and don'ts. The big thing that seems to drive some owl photography, especially what I see shared on social media, are photographs of owls with their eyes wide open. Yes, owl eyes are truly amazing. Um, but eyes wide open, ears, ears perked straight up, bodies stretched up thin or bodies cowering are all signs of stress in an owl. And I think that we should all recognize that those are signs of stress. Yes, sometimes you can be walking through the woods and you come across an owl by accident and both of you are surprised and a little stressed um, and you get the shots and go, you know, that's fine. But spending hours and days with the same bird constantly stressing it like this is not fine. And then we all hear stories about people purposely waking up owl, owls to startle them just to get that money shot of the eyes wide open. Stories we hear are some people knock on trees, some people bring squeaky toys to wake up owls, other people make other kinds of noises to wake up owls. This is a problem. I'd really love to show you some photos of owls that are stressed, but getting permission to show these problematic photos is pretty problematic. I had some, I didn't ask the person to show them and anyone who knows me knows that I really respect um, people's rights to their photos and acknowledging them. So I'm not showing them, um, but eyes wide open. If they have ears perked up, body stretched, those are all signs of stress. Something else about owls is to try to avoid drawing attention to the owls um, so that other predators don't, you know, investigate why it is that a group of people are there. Um, or even chickadees. Like if chickadees discover that there's an owl there, they will start um, mobbing it and draw attention to its being there, which might draw attention to potential predators. So it's always best to stand further back. This photo of a uh, snow owl that I have on the screen here, I took that from my car on the side of the road and it was a far across a farmer's field. I have a pretty big lens, so I'm able to um, you know, get relatively close even when the bird's far away, but that is far from a close up. But I actually like the context that it's showing it and that's how you see um, snowy owls frequently when you're driving um, in around farm fields. So go for wide angle shots. One of the problems is, is that some people might just have their phone or a really short lens, which is, which will encourage them to get really close. And an owl is gonna stay still rather than fly away um, because it doesn't wanna draw attention to itself. And so while it's staying still, it's probably getting really freaked out about how close you're getting to it. Um, and that I find that that's uh, unfortunate. Okay. Don't overstay your welcome. This is the other issue with um, celebrity birds is that um, large groups of people will go day after day after day. Um, you know, I think the good sort of imaginative moment here is to imagine if someone was standing in your bedroom staring at you all night long. That would freak me out. Um, and another issue that comes up is respecting private property, public roadways, and farmer's fields. Um, this comes up every winter there's a story about this um and is the shot so important that you need to walk on someone's private property without permission block public roadways or make it difficult for cars to get around especially if it's a fast roadway and um, you're putting yourself in danger and the driver in danger um just respect that there are other people involved in this other than you and getting that photo of the bird. Okay. Um, 
this is going to come up um, in the next section as well, which I'm just about to get to, and that's consider what you post on social media. Um, with celebrity kinds of birds like owls, don't stay at exact locations. There's nothing like an owl to draw huge crowds of people, um, which increases chances of stress to the bird. Always happens if you put an exact location. Avoid it. Avoid posting photos of stressed owls. This just works to normalize that as a pose that's okay to post, and that's a desirable shot. This is the problem with trying to get shots of owls with eyes wide open. Um, owls with their eyes partly drooped, you, you know, they're chill. They aren't stressed yet. Um, I would also encourage people to encourage administrators of Facebook bird groups to either ban owl photos or alternatively to require details about the photographer's visit to the owl. How far from the owl did you stand? How did you get that close up? Sometimes you can with equipment. With a really big lens and a really high resolution camera body, you can crop pretty closely and still get you know, a high quality shot. So it is possible to actually get close up crops um, from a safe distance. And how long were you there? You know, were you there all afternoon at one bird? Um, Facebook group admins might also consider limiting the number of owl photos that one person posts during the owl season. But the problem with putting the pressure on Facebook um, admins to filter owl photos is the amount of work that that can take. Some of these Facebook groups have thousands, um, you know, 6,000, 10,000 people. Um, they're not all posting, but many are. So it can become a full-time job, you know, managing them. And people are doing it for free um, out of the kindness of their heart. So it's kind of hard to ask Facebook admins to do a whole lot about this. I mean, I tend to lean towards just ban owl photo photos. It's just simpler and easier to do. But something we can all do when we're on social media, Facebook, Instagram, whatever it is, is be careful with the likes that you give. Um, the like is one of the main drivers behind what <clears throat> I think is an irrational fascination with taking photos of owls, especially with wide, eyes wide open. And if you want, comment on stressed owl photos and say, that owl looks stressed. Or contact the admins and say, that person's owl photo, the owl looks stressed. That photo should probably be removed. Um, so that's one action that we can take um, as sort of consumers of um, mm -hmm. images on social media. Speaking of social media, I would argue that social media is actually one of the main drivers of the amazing popularity of bird photography that we're seeing right now. And there's many things about that that I think are wonderful. Um, I think that there is what I would call an algorithmic power of, of the like, um, that people want likes for the photos. We all want people to like what we post, um, but it can get a bit irrational. Um, I also think that there's something I call the look like swipe logic of social media that encourages particular kinds of bird photographs and discourages other kinds of bird photographs. And to me, that's more important to be thinking about. Um, but it raises questions about the ethics of pre in preparing and posting bird photos for social media. So that's what I'm gonna talk about now. This will be about less than 10 minutes and then we'll get to the um, a, a very brief discussion about artificial intelligence. Social media, the good, the bad, and the ugly and beautiful. One of the great things about um, social media groups, especially on Facebook, but it also happens on Instagram to, to a degree, are that they create communities based around sharing photographs of birds and experience of being with birds. It's good. Folks take up the hobby, try to produce beautiful photographs like the ones they've seen on social media. They learn from the community. These communities can be very um, educational, very welcoming, um, nice places to be. Um, and, you know, during the pandemic, when we were all bored, a lot of people, you know, took this um, hobby up. And there's a certain rush to getting great photos of really challenging subjects. 
many people when they start um, photographing birds discover how incredibly hard it is to get photos of particular kinds of birds like warblers who bounce and move around all the time. How do you get them in focus? It takes a lot of patience and a lot of practice. Um, <clears throat> and we all like to get the positive feedback, likes and comments. It can be addictive. But the question I have that I want to talk about is how does social media encourage and shape bird photography? Because I think it does. I think it shapes particular kinds of bird photography that we see um, and, um, and prioritizes those over other kinds. So I want to talk a little bit about algorithms. We've all heard about algorithms and social media, probably. I want to talk a little bit about format. And I want to talk a little bit about this speed thing of look like swipe, the way that we actually can, the way that we're encouraged to consume um, social media stuff or content. So social media algorithms influence what receives attention. What does that mean? So social media algorithms have a bias towards posts with the most likes and the most comments you're more likely to see those at the top of your um, social media feed when you log into Facebook or Instagram. You're also more likely to see posts from people who are the most active posters. So the more you post, the more you're seen. And we're more likely to see popular photos in all of our social media feeds. And this encourages frequent posting for people who want their photos to be seen and liked and commented upon, the way that you get more followers, more likes, etc., is to post frequently. Well, that's one way. You have to also post good photographs. So part of the fun is receiving that almighty like and getting increased numbers of followers. All right, what about the social media format? I would say that, the, that social media is designed for small screens. It's designed mainly for mobile phones. Um, even desktop browsers, when you are on Facebook or Instagram, you just get this narrow column of posts. It doesn't fill the screen. Um, at least you can make the photos a little bigger by clicking on them, um, but they're still pretty small to begin with. Small screens favor uncomplicated close-ups. And I'm going to talk about this more in a minute. Okay, so the first one was social media algorithms um, post a lot. That influences what you see. Number two, the social media format of small screens, mobile phones. Number three, the logic of look like swipe. Social media is the perfect platform for fast consumption. This look like swipe logic and the endlessly scrolling through posts. We've all done it. Actually, I don't because I don't do any social media on my phone, but I do it on my laptop. Um, and I do go through it quickly. I scroll quickly through things. I go to certain groups that I like and I scroll through to see what people are posting. Um, I pause on the ones that I think are really interesting. I will, you know, like or love or whatever um, ones that I think are really great. And I'll put comment comments as well. And mobile phones are the perfect device for fast consumption. They're always with us. They're always available for passing the time, whether you're sitting on the bus or you're sitting on the can. You can have your phone with you and you can be scrolling through social media. And they're designed to send us notifications of the next post even if we tell our phones not to, sometimes they still come. This is one of my frustrations with my own mobile phone. So fast consumption requires fast production. We always need new, new, new in our social media streams so that we've got new stuff to look at. And they speed each other up. Some have argued that the speed of look like swipe leads leaves little time for meaning. And this quote that I'm about to read out from Franco Berardi, he's an Italian theorist. Um, I actually hold dear to my heart and I bring it up frequently with my students or in presentations like this. Here's what Berardi says. In the sphere of the digital economy, the faster information circulates, the faster value is accumulated. 
but meaning slows down this process as meaning needs time to be produced and to be elaborated and understood. So the acceleration of the info flow implies an elimination of meaning. That last sentence I think is so important because I think one of the things that happens in social media, media with bird photographs is that there is an elimination of meaning of some kind. But what do I mean by that? Hopefully that'll come clear soon. All right, so how does screen size shape bird photography? Well, first of all, it encourages clean and uncomplicated, uncomplicated photos. Here's two different photos of a black throated blue warbler. The one on the left, cluttered. Um, but it's actually showing the bird performing a kind of behavior that's really sort of central to how black throated blue warblers live. The one on the right, clean background, you know, really pretty pose. Um, that photo would do well in the environment. The cluttered background photo, probably not so well. Here's another one, close-ups. So we've got a uh, bay-breasted warbler on the left, good close-up, lots of that blurry bokeh in the background to, uh, to bring the fore to distinguish the foreground bird from the background. That photo would do well on social media. The one on the right, which is also of a bay-breasted warbler, warbler, it is somewhat more complex, but more importantly, it's this wide angle shot. The bird's really small. On a phone, you'd have a hard time seeing the bird. Um, so that photo just does not do well. So the question, what's lost in uncluttered close-ups? For me, what's lost is context, habitat, environment, and other life. And so in my own research that I've been doing, I read a bit of eth ethological research, especially from um, philosophers talking about ethology. And that ethology, ethology has been teaching us that species are bound in evolutionary relationships with each other, that they're co-evolutionary relationships, that they co-become together over these very long periods of time. And the most common example of this is the pollinating bee in the flower. It's really hard to um, um, to pry apart the relationship of a pollinating bee and the flower. In fact, half the time when you see a pollinating bee, you see evidence of the flower all over it in terms of its pollen. Um, they've evolved together. It's really difficult to think of one without the other. And some might argue that they are kind of one thing um, because they need each other so much. I think this can be applied to birds, that birds live in environments as well, and that they, they have evolved over time to be how to act the way they act and to look the way they look um, in these very long periods of evolutionary development in relation to the life around them. So in an uncluttered close up, I think much of that context is lost. Um, and I like to think that it's worthwhile thinking about bringing some of that back into photography. Now I do both kinds. Um, and so here are two examples of an <laughs> uncluttered close-ups um, that tend to dominate social media. It's the black brain warbler on the left with that sort of uh, bluey yellow bokeh in the background. It's all about the bird, very little about context. And it's the same with that black throated blue warbler. Um, these are really typical, the kinds of photographs that one sees in a lot of social media feeds, not all, but a lot. But what's gained in including backgrounds? I think this photo of a palm warbler with that very rich background, that very rich sort of environmental um, focus um, is really interesting. And it shows the bird in its broader context. Some would say that the subject's too small but I would say, well, what's the subject? The subject's not just the bird, it's its environment. Um, recently, I took a couple of more photos like this down at Princess Point. One on the left is a fall plumaged yellow rock warbler standing in grasses and standing in a separate set of grasses or, or perched in a separate set of grasses is a um, song sparrow. For me, these, these photographs are more interesting because they show a bird within its context. Um, and you can still see the bird. Um, it's not like a, a close-up is necessary to see the field markings of the bird. 
Unfortunately, some of the common strategies that have developed um, to increase social media attention um, are potentially problematic, in my opinion. Others may feel differently, and that is fine. Um, one is to crop really closely um, instead of opening up the photo to a wider um, ang to a wider angle. And another practice I'm seeing a lot and with more frequency is replacing backgrounds altogether. Software now makes it really easy to select everything in the background, remove it and replace it with something else altogether. And what I see a lot of is people replacing it with what I call fake bokeh, uh, fake blurry backgrounds. Um, and this is increasingly popular. Um, for me, it raises questions about truth of representation, also raises question about ethical image editing. And we're about to leap into the deep unknown of artificial intelligence. Um, one slide first. Just to summarize, social media tends to encourage certain kinds of photographs, uncomplicated by habitat and easy to see on a small screen. They don't carry much context beyond the bird on a perch or bird on the water or bird um, you know, standing on something. Um, and they can represent birds as separate from their environments. They don't always do that, but they can. And for me, is this a limitation in how birds are represented? Yes. Is this a division between artistic and documentative photograph photography? Partly. But I ask, is there a responsibility when promoting awareness and conservation in our photographs? And then is this a question of ethics? And again, for me, that's a maybe with the question of how much editing is too much editing. And here we move into the really thorny quagmire of artificial intelligence. I'm almost done. And some questions we need to consider. And I think that the OFO needs to consider. I think um, Cornell with eBird needs to consider. I'm sure they are. I searched around. I haven't seen anything yet, but maybe someone else has. I think I naturalist has started thinking about it is how much photo editing is too much? What does artificial intelligence mean for bird photography? And are we prepared for AI? No, we're not. So I don't know if any of you on Facebook have ever come across the group called Natural Beauty, but Natural Beauty, from what I can tell, is just an artificial intelligence generating engine um, for birds. Look at this. Have you ever seen an American Robin that looks quite like that? No. I've not. Or what about bald eagle chicks that look like just miniature adult bald eagles? Or that Carolina wren? You know, there's something partly right about the Carolina wren, but that's no Carolina wren. That's generated by AI. And so going through the Natural Beauty Facebook group and looking at the photos can be funny because you can say, oh, that doesn't look anything like the bird. That's silly. But these are really early days. I remember very well the winter of 2023 when I was teaching at McMaster University and chat GPT came out and it was suddenly writing papers and exam question answers for students. And we were in the middle of term and this was happening and most you know, professors freaked out. We didn't know what to do about it. It's only been not even two years. I think actually chat GPT GPT was um, introduced at the end of November 2023. So we're just, or 2022. So we're just coming up to a two year anniversary. What's this going to look like in five years? Just imagine how good the technology is going to be and how prepared are organizations to deal with it. My fear is not very prepared. I don't even know how to prepare. Um, one thing we need to figure out is what does AI even mean? A lot of software developer and manufacturers will say that their latest, greatest features are AI based. I don't always believe that. Um, one example is Adobe Lightroom. They've improved their noise reduction tool dramatically and they cut noise is like the grain in a photo and they call it AI. What I think it's doing is sampling parts of the image and making really good decisions about how to remove um, noise from the image, but it doesn't generate that image um, from going out to other images um, online to do that. But other generative AI tools do that. 
They learn from sampling images online. They generate completely artificial images from a composite of other images to train the system. And in other words, they perform plagiarism, which, you know, people who know me know that I'm pretty um, offended by how AI um, is doing that. This is an enormous question um, coming up um, for all birding organizations, for all wildlife organizations, for everything. Um, and then and really strict guidelines need to be developed. Tools need to be developed to detect when something is AI. It's a big issue. I don't think we're ready for it, but we need to start getting ready for it right away. Um, and that's where I'm going to end because I just haven't thought my way all the way through artificial intelligence yet. And maybe people in the audience have. Um, so I want to end before questions just with saying thank you. There's my contact information and my photo website, birdsnaps.ca. Um, I'm entirely open to some questions. And thank you for the time. That was fascinating. Excellent. Thank you so much. I'm just going to see if I can get the screen back. Maybe. I actually Maybe. found it. If you're, if it's, are we, are we doing questions for Andrew right now? Yes. I'm trying to get. Yeah. I think you have it back. <laughs> I, I see everybody now. Do you? I do not. Uh, for some reason, I think Andrew got logged out. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say I don't see Andrew right. Now. I'll text him and see. Hang on. I just put him back in. Oh, did you? Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Here we go. We're getting it back now. Oh, cool. To the end, or uh, there we are. I don't know what happened. Oh. <laughs> well, thank I don't you, know what happened, Andrew. <laughs> How was... long have I been not here? Just oh no! Just... One minute. One minute. All right. Mm -hmm. So does anybody have questions for Andrew or comments to share? I, I don't have a question, but I, I, if anybody knows me, it's Paul Riss. If anybody knows me, they know that I spent a good bit of time with Andrew and I was around for some of those photographs you looked at probably. Um, I didn't actually ever consider that thought that the kind of pictures that we're posting on social media and watching them like the idea that it's actually changing the algorithm is showing things that are bad for the environment and it's good, like that's much deeper than um than i'd thought about that so i just want to say i appreciate you talking about that and making me think about that Thanks, Paul. I mean, I would just say they aren't necessarily bad for the environment. They are just one kind of image. And they aren't all just that kind of image. There's just a preponderance of them. And it's a particular way of seeing um, wildlife. Um, one that I think could be, um, could be nicely expanded by showing other kinds of representations of wildlife other than just that sort of individuated bird on a stick or, you know, mm -hmm. on standing in the water or a duck floating on the water. I mean, it gets tough with ducks because that is their environment. Um, Linda, I see your hand up. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm glad you brought up that AI question because I had a video by a girlfriend uh, back where I used to teach in Ottawa and she sent me this video, it had video clips, and it was birds, uh, adult birds flying with their chicks on their back. Oh, <laughs> uh, oh yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And the worst yeah. one was the one with the four owlets on the snowy owl's back. And she said, I have I that one, I can show this. you. <laughs> yeah. And so I sent it to her and I said, Sent it, or I re replied to her and I said, oh yeah, that's AI generated. That is ridiculous. And she said, well, I thought it was, and she's not a birder at all. And she even thought it was silly. And I thought, good. Yeah. Oh. You know, on this natural beauty Facebook group, the number of loves and likes and super positive comments is in the hundreds for these mm -hmm. images. Like they're, they're, this is false information. I know. 
just nuts. Or to quote someone who I don't like, it's fake news, right? Yeah. Like it's just, it's bad. That is bad. Um, because when I do bird photography, things. I send out my nature walks to almost a hundred people to inform them what I'm seeing. And I, I put a note under each one about the bird and what I've learned. And they are so appreciative because they're learning. And so now I'm going to have to include something about these crazy things they might be seeing <laughs> online. I know. And, and, this is just the beginning yes. of the problem. Like yes. what happens when people start reporting birds <laughs> that didn't actually exist somewhere with yep. photos that look perfect, that are hard to dispute. Um, so it kind of draws into question the, the kind of um, truth of even just um, posting, you know, birds being somewhere. Unless we can figure out ways I mean, Adobe did once talk about embedding metadata into images created in Adobe that will document what kinds of artificial intelligence have been used. And that's a great idea. Um, but I don't know that even that would, would, would fix everything because a lot of the AI tools that people use have nothing to do with Adobe. Some other companies made them and they create these, um, these interesting photos. I've actually been playing around with that a little bit because of what I do for a living. I have an Adobe CC subscription, so I get access to their AI. And I made a very convincing Eastern Bluebird. <laughs> like, I mean, it was very, con I don't post these online or anything like that. I just try and um, see how it works, just experiment. You know, I don't do anything with the images. I don't save them. But uh, did you yeah. send it to me? I probably did. If I if I don't if I didn't, I might have it still on my hard drive somewhere, but I don't think so. I think I got rid of it. But okay. I probably sent it to you saying, wow. <laughs> yeah. Jack. Uh, yeah, thank you, Andrew. I, I really appreciated your comments about the um the influence of social media and um the risks related to AI. Uh, and I just um want to go back to one of your comments about. Um, being too close or sticking around too long and how that might attract a predator. Mm -hmm. So I, I had an experience just like that uh, a couple of weeks ago at Tommy Thompson Park in Toronto. I was, I was checking a shoreline very carefully for um, a potential shorebird, and they're very good at hiding when they're sleeping. Um, and I kind of walked right past one, uh, but then it started moving around and foraging, so I saw it. But then out of the corner of my eye, I saw a peregrine oh, that yeah. flew in and landed on the cormorant structure some, let's say, 40 or 50 meters away. But immediately I thought, I better not stick around too long because I'll be drawing attention to this poor little sandpiper. Yeah. Um, so I did take a couple of photos. I got a couple of nice ones, but I, I walked away and about less than five minutes later, doesn't the peregrine land on the tip of the peninsula with a bird in its talons and it starts eating it? Yeah. And I'm thinking, oh no, I hope that's not my sandpiper. And um, so anyway, I, I, I watched for a while and then went back to try and refine the uh, uh, the white rumped sandpiper. As I said, they're very good at hiding. So maybe it was hiding, but I couldn't refind it. And I just had this awful feeling yeah. in the pit of my stomach that maybe my taking that extra photo uh, led to the bird's demise. So there, anyway, there was a real lesson there for me. Just don't stick around too long. So I experienced this um, almost every fall in Woodland Cemetery um, in Hamilton where every fall an immature cooper's hawk shows up and sometimes those cooper's hawks are really smart they begin to um connect you with you know the birds and mm -hmm. so i'm convinced that there was one this year and one a few years ago that they follow me that they know where i am and that they somehow make a connection between me 
standing there doing what I'm doing and birds um, that they can eat. I mean, this fast, past fall, you know, I watched one, you know, juvenile birds can be so funny sometimes. I watched one slam into a cedar tree and scare about 40 birds out of it. He didn't get anything because, you know, he's still learning how to do it. But I said, shit, <laughs> you know, I wish he wasn't here. Um, it, it's a problem. I don't, I, I mean, I didn't go home. I still continue to walk around looking for birds. Um, but I do think that we can sometimes attract, birds aren't stupid, um, right? You know, they learn how to hunt. I mean, they probably associate things um, with the availability of things or even just seeing you. And, you know, he may have then just seen, oh, look, there's a, you know, sandpiper down there as well. He yeah. might not have been looking for you specifically to guide him to a sandpiper, but just seeing you may have pointed it out. I thought you were going to say it was a purple sandpiper. <laughs> um, <laughs> it should be arriving any day now. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, thank you, Andrew. Sure, thanks, Jack. I don't know if anyone has suggestions on what to do about this AI thing, but I really see this uh, you know, as much as you know ethics and how we bird in spaces and how we need to be attentive to spaces are really, really important. I think AI represents a far bigger issue and problem. Um, for us and it's coming fast like very fast mm -hmm. is there anyone on the ofo um executive here well i mean other than other than angie <laughs> i think i was gonna say jack but you're not right now kind of <laughs> i am jack yeah. is has it come up in oh, conversation yeah. what to do about ai I don't think it's come up, but maybe it needs to. You know, Andrew, the, you know, the nice thing about records anyway is they're usually peer reviewed and there's enough people out there going to see rarities that it's probably not going to be an issue. But in terms of photography, people have, you know, ever since Photoshop showed up, people have been manipulating their photos now. It's true. I do think we need to distinguish between you know, sort of run of the mill every day editing in Photoshop, like removing a branch that's not in front of a bird, but that might be creating an imbalance in a photograph. I don't have huge problems with that. I do have problems when you remove a branch that crosses a bird and suddenly you're rearranging the feather pattern <laughs> on the bird and you might be rearranging the markings. Some of you may have seen a photograph that appeared, um, I think it was in September. Um, I think the photograph came out of the Waterloo region. And it was a really weird looking chestnut sided warbler. Um, and it sparked a conversation about, oh, this is some kind of crazy hybrid that we're looking at here. Right? Because, you know, the markings were odd and strange. Um, and someone from California first... <laughs> contacted Paul and then contact Paul Riss and then contacted me as he'll do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he looked right at the pixel level of this and saw that there were dramatic differences in sort of the grain of the image and the absolute lack of grain in places and was able to see that this person has used some kind of, um, you know, AI tech to remove a branch and it changed the um, feather patterns of the bird and also the markings of the bird because the software is looking to the bird to think about what's most appropriate to put in its place. And, you know, it created a weird hybrid. Now, thankfully, I think someone, you know, got in touch with the person who posted it and he took it down. Um, but I saw a conversation on iNaturalist um, around this. I think it was oh sometime in early summer or late spring and someone had posted a vermilion flycatcher um, and showed how um, the ai that had been used to remove something in front of it excuse me um had done something re remarkably problematic to uh, i think to the primaries that there were just there were more <laughs> than, than there should have been um 
So I guess one problem is with, you know, the odd birds that we see that are either hybrids or that have some kind of genetic um, difference about them. But you're right about peer review, but is peer review, if there's only one photo, are people able to see that this is a generated image rather than an actual image? I mean, I don't know how the, um, the Ontario Bird Records Committee works in terms of how many images of a bird they need before they accept it, um, but it's a question they should be thinking about. In terms of, uh, Andrew, in terms of, uh, you know, how we should respond to a photo that's obviously AI generated, um, maybe the same way that you suggested that we could respond to uh, an owl photo where the bird is obviously stressed. And, yeah. you know, if people just comment, hey, this looks fake, this looks AI generated. Well, what's funny is that someone did that to me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so back in, in September, Paul, Ritz, and I were at Princess Point, and we had this wonderful moment where a bunch of warblers flew into these beautiful yellow flowers, and they were just there in front of us, and so I was taking photos of them, and it was beautiful, um, and I got this one photo of a Nashville warbler with these beautiful yellow flowers, and I posted it, and someone said, Andrew, if I didn't know it was you, I would say that this was AI generated, and I think that was a compliment. <laughs> I think that was a company. Yeah, I think I, I remember that. I remember yeah, Mark that. Mark Yeah. Yeah, it was something about the light that was happening and the yellow and the like things that were in focus and out of focus. There was something really quite magical actually about that was yeah. probably only three and a half minutes of time. <laughs> yeah, the moment the moment was beautiful. Um but I have to say that calling people out on social media is a risk. Um, because you know how social media works is that people can pile on you. Um, and so when I was suggesting that people might call out um, owls that look stressed, you know, you're taking a risk doing that. You're taking a risk that you're going to get all kinds of other people just slamming on you. Social media does not work rationally. Um, mm -hmm. You know, people have this feeling of, anonymity even though their name is there and they will slam you for the slightest things mm -hmm. um so i find it hard to you know encourage people too much to uh, call out um birds that look stressed i don't do it directly with the person i will contact the administrators um on one of the groups that i belong on and say this owl is stressed there's no mm -hmm. doubt about it um and hope that they do something about it mm -hmm. I'm going to take a moment right now to say thank you again to Andrew. That was fantastic and so interesting. I never even thought about the AI thing. That it's completely new. Linda's giving you a little round of applause. Um, <laughs> I see a lot of people are signing out, and that's fine. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight and sitting in. But uh, don't feel you need to rush oh, off. Andrew. Andrew has time to an answer questions or chat. Then. You know, we'll take the time. So that's great. But nice to see everybody out tonight. And our next meeting will be the first Wednesday of December. I can't remember what the topic is right now. But I'll see you then. Short, shorebirds. Shorebirds. Yes, it is. Yeah. Thank you. Shorebirds. Christian, Christian. Freeze from yes. CWS who right. oversees the shorebird monitoring for Ontario. Mm -hmm. It should be a good one. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody very much. I, I will say that Kyle has asked an interesting question in the chat, which was, what's the best approach to sharing bird locations online? Mm -hmm. um, in social media, I don't. <laughs> I, I, and one of the reasons I don't is because I don't want a whole bunch of people coming, you know, when I'm there the next time. Um, but people do on Discord, right? Most of us here probably use Discord. We'll post rarities, you know. It's a tough one. Yeah. We're pretty, uh, we've been pretty open about posting even owls 
in our own kind of vicinity here, but that's because there's nobody coming up. You like, don't have really five awesome. million people w within short driving distance of you. No, no. You know, and we can say, well, there's a Northern Hawk Owl or whatever. There isn't right now, but a few years ago we had almost every time we went out, there was one in the same spot. But nobody was going to drive all the way here to see it. No. I mean, and the hope this year apparently is that we're going to see a bunch of boreal owls around because they've been mm -hmm. showing up at, uh, is it Whitefish and on Michigan, wherever it is that they've been showing up. That's cool. You know, yeah. boreal owls are neat. Ideally, yeah. we'll find one. <laughs> What's that, Paul? So, I'll say, ideally, we only find one. And the rest of them just get to be left alone. <laughs> so there's like they all these owls are the flipping coins to find out who has to go to the spot and let some birder see them and just be the sacrificial lamb. <laughs> so, so sad. I was going to say that was so fascinating. Thank you. Um, it was just fantastic i i don't do a lot of photography when i go birding i i kind of just immerse myself in the in the birding and i know i mean i just have a samsung and i thought about getting a camera but um i came to this because i really wanted to know some of the issues and and it's so important um but yeah i, I uh i've never super been drawn to taking photos I just want to look at the birds I'm just so moved by them so it's it's just a different I, I just do it a different way I guess one most day maybe the, I will but I'm yeah. in that lane too yeah most of the people that I go out with all of the people that I go out with they don't carry cameras with them okay well, there's a, and you know the, there's a group of us that will you know go out burning yeah. I'm the only person who carries a camera mm. <laughs> But it's always in I will say it's always interesting for me to see the picture a couple of hours later or however many hours mm, later yeah. after we've parted ways and Andrew's gone home and does it, done his editing and um yeah, and then I get to see that bird yes, from absolutely two feet to the side. <laughs> you know, I remember um, one time when uh, my husband and I were relatively new birders, and so we're going back. A couple decades or so give or take and we found a cattle egret and we wrote a description of it with mm -hmm. words and then i made a sketch yeah. of it and i'm not an artist <laughs> i'm but I'm, i made a sketch of it and labeled the field marks on the sketch and that was how we submitted it to you know to the bird records committee that was the way that everybody was submitting things to the bird records committee yeah photography is a little bit of a dual-edged sword <laughs> you know one yeah. of the good things about it is when when there is like a, a stunning rarity um and it needs to go to the OB, ontario bird record committee the obrc you know, photos obviously help a lot mm -hmm. <laughs> in establishing mm -hmm. that that bird was there. Mm -hmm. um, but the other side of it is that, um, you know, one of the, you've just made me think that one of the things that maybe we see less of are people drawing, you know, birds. Some people I'm still do. I mean, I still see drawings of birds. Paul, who's mm -hmm. left, um, he draws birds. Um mm -hmm. And a lot of people still do. And I think that that is a beautiful art um, of representing birds. Well, my I drawing just bought this like book it. called, uh, I don't know if you can see it. Ornotherapy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. By Holly Merker and um, and Dave, uh, Scott Whedon saw, I went on an Audubon trip and it was really interesting. And, and, and one of them is to kind of get in touch with birds is to try drawing them when you get home or, um, yeah, it's really a, a kind of a very involved thing to do. And it would certainly get you thinking about field markings, right? You know, what what defines this yeah. bird by the way it looks. I mean, that's one of the, early on, that's one of the reasons why I was photographing birds because I didn't know what I was looking at. Mm. And so I would come home and compare it to a bird book or an online resource and say, oh, 
So my brother Bruce today sent me this photograph that someone sent him on a boat off of Newfoundland. And he sent it to me and I said, huh, what's that? Like it was a warbler. And I started looking and I said, I wonder if that's a McGillivray's warbler. Like, what the hell is a McGillivray's warbler doing on a ship off of the coast of Newfoundland? And that's sort of where he landed as well. And so the photograph really helped in that yeah. instance. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they, they aren't always required. And I think drawing is a, is, it's a nice is, way to slow down and think about them. It sure is. Yeah. It's yeah. a very it's good size to even just to to explain you know be able to write a sentence about what yeah. you're actually looking at mm -hmm. you mean rather than in your ebird saying photo attached yeah <laughs> to exactly. actually describe the bird that you saw yeah. <laughs> my problem is that i need my reading glasses to see the camera, the, the you know, yep. the display on the digital camera. By the time that I get my glasses on and get the, I mean, the bird's probably gone. Yeah, I, I have I have broken several pair of glasses hanging them here while I'm out birding and bringing them up and doing that very same thing. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, this has been a lot of fun. I'm really glad that you um, invited me to come and talk. Um, That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. We're and when you start through. talking about AI, I want to be there um, yeah. to hear what people have to say. Well, there is another another conversation to have in time, I guess. Yeah. You know, I never thought about AI. This Nate, what was that website? Nature's Beauty or? Oh, it's a Facebook group Facebook. called uh, Natural Beauty. Natural beauty. Obviously, nothing natural about it. That's the oh. ironic thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm the crazy bird lady in my town, right? And and people send me pictures. Yep. And that has come up a few times. And they said, look at this beautiful bird. We thought you would really like to see it. You know, what is it? And I'm like, I have no idea what it is. It doesn't look like anything we have here. But doesn't exist on this planet. <laughs> it's probably not even a real bird. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, That's and it's crazy. it's only going to, it really is only going to continue. So at work, oh. we're teaching at a university. You, you know, we, we say, my group who teach in media arts, we tell our students, no using artificial intelligence to generate any of your work. We're interested in your creative work, not someone else's creative work. Mm -hmm. But other parts yeah. of campus see it as um, as really useful um, I think in engineering and perhaps sciences or other places. I mean, don't quote me on this. Oh, you're still recording. Cut this out. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, I need but, to stop recording, actually. I forgot. I always forget to start it, and I always forget to stop it. It's a problem, um, and it's a problem that we all recognize that is not going away and that we need to find better ways 